Great. Well, uh, everybody. Good evening uh, and welcome to the Welsh Government's Sustainable Farming Scheme live event. Croeso cynnes i'r digwyddiad byw y mae drafod y cynllun ffermio cynaliadwy newydd. Ale Jones ydw i, I'm Ale Jones. I'm going to be chairing uh, this Q&A session for the next hour or so. And I'm grateful to have the company of, uh, I think, 60 attendees at the moment and the numbers are increasing uh, every second. So it's great. There's been some strong interest in this session. Because last week, the Minister for Rural Affairs, Leslie Griffiths, published her outline proposals uh, for the new sustainable farming scheme. The scheme, of course, will replace BPS and is uh, proposed to start in 2025. Some of you may have already had an opportunity to read the document, maybe just take a quick glance or maybe not at all. But tonight's an opportunity for us to unpick some of the detail behind the proposals um, and walk through that 70 page document chapter by chapter in a conversational Q&A um, style format with James Owen, the Deputy Director for Land Management Reform with uh, the Welsh Government. I'll ask James to introduce himself in just a moment. Before we do that, however, uh, I just have some quick housekeeping points to go through. This session is being recorded here tonight and a copy of the recording will be made available shortly afterwards on the Welsh Government website. Please feel free to ask as many questions as you want. I can see um, some activity already in the Q&A box, which is brilliant. So this is the opportunity for us to put your questions to James to understand a bit more about how this scheme is going to operate. Mana groesoch i wrth gwrsi ofyn cwestiwn yn y Gymraeg, os mae well gyda chi, na'i mwrae i gyfieithu ar y pryd. Felly, gwneud chi'n siŵr bych yn gofyn cwestiwn am y rhyddid gennych chi i, I ddewis pai aeth sy'n mwy cyffyrddus i chi wneud hynny. So, we will try and cover off all the questions that we can in the time we have allowed for this evening. If we fail to do so, um, I am told that the Welsh Government are working on a FAQ document, a frequently asked questions document which would again will be published on their website uh, very soon. So as I mentioned at the beginning I'm joined here this evening by James Owen the Deputy Director for Land Management Reform. Croeso Cynnes, welcome James. Uh, James can you just tell us a bit about your background, your role and your involvement in the scheme development to date? Uh, well, not so far, Aled, and not so far, Pau. You know, fantastic to be uh, here this evening and an opportunity to, uh, uh, I think I, I think you're right in terms of walking through the scheme proposals that we published uh, last week and looking forward to, you know, a healthy debate and, uh, and no doubt lots of questions as we go through. Uh, I did want to say, just hope everyone's keeping well in the warm and, uh, and the heat that we've got at the moment. Uh, uh, it's really, um, uh, I know, busy time for farmers uh, at this stage. Uh, looking forward to further engagement um, over the course of the next few uh, weeks and months through the show season as well. So really looking forward to continuing the conversation uh, in person in many events as well. Um, my, my role in the Welsh Government is uh, is to develop the, the policy and the programme uh, for our sustainable farming scheme. Uh, you know, many of you will know that we have consulted on our proposals three times in the uh, uh, since the Brexit referendum in uh, 2016. Uh, we've developed our proposals. We've we've worked in co-design with farmers over that period to to develop them into the to the document that we published last week. Uh, I'm also responsible for the evidence program that supports um, uh, the actions that sit behind the proposals uh, and the agriculture bill. So developing the provisions that will form part of the bill that the minister will uh, introduce into the Senate later this year. So yeah, great to be here tonight and looking forward to a, a really good debate. Brilliant. Thank you very much, James. Now, as you're aware, there's, there've been several consultations starting with Brexit in our land. And what's different about this document that was published last week? Yeah, thanks, Alid. Uh, so I think, first of all, it's the most information we've published about our proposed scheme uh, at all, actually. So over the period of time uh, since our Brexit and our land consultation in 2018, we've we've been developing the policy to sit be behind, if you like, the high level framework. You know, and we were really delighted that we could um, publish last week details of the actions that we want farmers to undertake as part of the scheme, more information about the process that we see um, supporting it. Uh, and also, crucially, I think, linking the, the different types of outcomes that we're seeking to achieve through the scheme back to those actions. So uh, a lot more detail, I think, that, uh, than uh, we've uh, published before. And we've also tried our very best and, um, you know, grateful for any views or feedback on that to make this a farmer friendly document. So, uh, you know, we've written this with the farmer in mind 
mind. We've tried to, you know, explain in the best uh, in the best way that we can, you know, exactly uh, how we see the the proposed scheme operating, the types of actions we want farmers to undertake, uh, and what essentially um, the process for entry to the scheme will be. So, um, so it's, again, it's really exciting to kind of have the document out there and to be able to talk to people about it now, having having us worked on it over iterations in the last couple of years. Yeah. And with the, the documents now in public, it's been um, on your website for over a week. I'm sure a lot of people have, have had a look at it and there's been some reaction, I'm sure, from the farming unions and the farming community more broadly. How would you assess, James, the reaction and response to what's been proposed to date? Yeah, I think it's been a, a broadly positive response. Um, you know, we've had a lot of engagement over the last couple of years with um, farming unions, uh, with other stakeholder representatives, and of course with farmers themselves. And I think that's that's hopefully helped with some of that positive response because what we've tried to do is develop the proposals based on the feedback that we've received from uh, those stakeholders and those farmers. So, so I think broadly positive. We've we've of course had a lot of questions, and I can see there's one already in the in the Q and A around trees, and we'll no doubt come to that during the the course of this session um uh, you know and and of course that was i think the headline on the bbc site was around tree planting but i would like to think there's a well there is a huge amount more in the scheme that we'll um we'll want to uh, maybe talk about tonight uh, uh than just that kind of media headline because um you know i think it is a really important um document for farmers um you know one of our aims really in in publishing at this time is to is to have both engagement but also to prepare farmers for the, for the changes that we're that we're proposing so you know we do want sometimes to look behind the headlines that um uh, that are that are put out in terms of response to scheme and maybe talk a bit about some of the detail of the actions that sit underneath it and whilst these are proposals at this stage am i writing saying james that this is not a formal consultation at this stage. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So um, uh, there are some you know, formal legal processes that we have to go through around consultation, which is essentially to publish a, a proposal and then wait a period of time before assessing responses. What we wanted to do with this document was to have some genuine engagement on, uh, on what we're proposing in the scheme. So not a formal consultation. We're re really interested in the views of uh, farmers and stakeholders and, and other interested parties actually in, in the proposed scheme, um, recognising that is a, you know, a significant landmark change for um, you know the future of agriculture in Wales and the support provided by government. Um, so we felt going into a process of co-design where we could test the proposals, the deliverable, deliverability and practicality of those proposals with farmers uh, in a more perhaps informal and hopefully engaging way uh, would be better than a formal consultation. But I just in terms of, um, you know, we the minister has committed next year to to undertake that fi a, a, a formal consultation on the final scheme proposals. So we're about a year out, I think, from developing our final proposals, which we will then consult on. And uh, just picking up on the question that's in the, the Q&A, and I'm sure you'll want to come on to some of the bits around trialling the new scheme later on when you're walking through the chapters, James, but th there is a question at the beginning saying, how will the Welsh Government ensure that the correct stakeholders are engaged and consulted? This is a conversation, it's an evolution. Um, so how are you going to make sure that happens? And you might want to touch a bit about the pilot or defer, defer that part of the question to later on when you're talking through the document. Yeah, maybe if I could talk about piloting later, but I, I think it's a really good question. I mean, what we've been trying to do um, over the last couple of years is develop, um, you know, as I say, effective ways of sharing information about our proposals with stakeholders. So we've uh, we've worked with farming unions to share iterations of, um, uh, you know, some of the ideas we had behind the actions. We've worked uh, with a range of bodies in terms of developing the evidence that sits behind the actions and demonstrating, if you like, the link between the actions we'll ask farmers to undertake and, and the outcomes that we hope they will uh, deliver. Uh, in terms of our next stage, what we've uh, what we've asked stakeholders, and we have a we had a meeting actually of I think thirty or so stakeholder organisations on on Friday. What we've asked them to do is is to obviously encourage their members to um, to read the proposals, to engage in our co-design period, uh, and then directly for those organisations themselves, um, we will be looking to hold a series of. Um, uh, working groups essentially to talk through some of the various aspects of the proposals as part of the co-design process. So, for example, we know, uh, you know, we will want to test the proposals in relation to tenant farmers. So uh, we'll want to create a tenancy working group with stakeholders to work through how the proposals may work for tenant farmers, any barriers they may face and what we might need to look at specifically for tenant farmers. In the same way, we want to do that around common land, uh, 
uh, we want to do that around um, cross border farms, new entrants to farming uh, and a few other subgroups. So so the idea is to continue the dialogue that we've been having with stakeholders over the coming months, but but maybe uh, into some specific um, subject areas so we can really test the proposals with them uh, and how they work or, 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 or how they don't work actually for some sectors so that we can we can listen to feedback and we can adapt our proposals accordingly. And there's been quite a bit of co-design already up until now. How successful has that been, James? And, and ha have you um, picked up on some of the key messages from that co-design in this latest document? I hope so. Um, you know, I'm interested in the, the views of people on the call around that. But I think if you if you compare the the publication of our proposals in 2018 to now, they, they you know I think there is a you know a fair amount of movement in terms of where government has listened and responded to some concerns about the initial proposals that we put out and uh, and the kind of priority and preference around how we've how we've structured the design of the scheme. Um, you know, we've we've been really fortunate in our policy team to to work with um, you know. Uh, around 2000 farmers who put their hands up to uh, engage with us in a process of co-design uh, initially uh, and we gained a huge amount of um, feedback um, and ideas really from working with those farmers around 18 months ago on, on what the scheme proposals might be um, you know and that's a process that's continued right up until publication of the scheme we've uh, we've regularly tested if you like the ideas that um, form part of the scheme and um, uh, the, the kind of actions that will ask farmers to undertake with farmers themselves. So they, they've very much been intrinsic to our kind of policy development process. But, you know, we do recognise that, you know, this is a great opportunity with publishing the scheme now to engage an even wider group of um, farmers. Um, and, and, you know, crucially, as I, as I mentioned earlier, to help them prepare for the uh, introduction of the scheme in a couple of years time. Brilliant. Thank you, James. I'm just keeping an eye on the Q&A. There's LEM questions. Uh, that's brilliant. Keep them coming. I know there's a lot of questions around tree cover and the 10% as, as we expected. And uh, James, I know you are going to pick up that uh, in detail when we when we get to that section. So let's start by walking through the document, um, James. And I know you want to try and go through chapter by chapter. So I know chapter one is the executive summary, but chapter two is the scheme introduction where you're laying down some of the objectives and some of the outcomes you want to see. So um, pick out some of the key highlights there. Yeah, thanks, Alid. So I think um, I'll probably cover this fairly briefly, but we've we've got a framework for future agricultural policy and support in Wales that we've proposed around sustainable land management. Um, uh, and that's uh, that framework is designed really to recognise the complementary objectives, as we see it, of supporting farmers to produce food sustainably alongside supporting them to take actions to deliver uh, against the climate and nature emergencies, which are you know existential threats, if you like, to um, to society, and uh, and we really want to support farmers in our in how we how we combat those um, those situations. Um, we also have an objective in there about supporting uh, the, the the vitality of rural communities and sustaining the Welsh language. So, um, in in the chapter, we really set out sustainable land management as our framework for future support, and I, and I hope it gives a bit of an overarching flavour of what we're trying to do through the scheme, because yeah, as I say. We're trying to achieve complementary objectives, not competing objectives. Um, we want to support farmers to produce food sustainably, uh, whilst at the same time um, supporting them for the actions they often already undertake on their farms, which deliver environmental uh, outcomes. So we uh, we we restate, if you like, our commitment to that framework. We also uh, pu um, have published these before, but I think you know, in, in a more um, helpful way hopefully for farmers we've also published what we call our outcomes so our sustainable land management outcomes that we're hoping to achieve um, uh, and what we've done throughout the document is tie those outcomes to the actions that we're asking farmers to undertake so we've made the direct link if you like between uh, what we're asking a farmer to do and why we're asking them to do it because those are the outcomes we're seeking uh, to support uh, finally in, in the introduction we talk a bit about the design principles that have informed uh, how we've how we've gone about the development of the scheme uh, actually since 2018 um, and it's surprising really to, to think that the the design principles themselves haven't changed much in substance but you know they have guided our kind of hand if you like in terms of what we've been trying to do uh, to, to, to bring this scheme to life if you like in this publication so there's those principles about keeping farmers on the land uh, recognizing the importance of food production for our nature, nation supporting uh, a prosperous and resilient agriculture industry whilst at the same time uh, maximizing the delivery of those outcomes that I talked about um, you know those have been really um, key principles as we've designed the policy um, uh, around the structure of the scheme and also how we want farmers to enter the scheme um, and, and just finally perhaps just to say a little bit about our, our general approach there because um, you know often I think 
we you know there's a, a bit of a polarized debate about um, the production of food um, uh, and the environment we we very much favor a a, a land sharing approach whereby you know um, the production of food happens alongside um uh, you know, care and nature friendly farming initiatives for the environment. Uh, and really, that's what the scheme has been designed to do. It's been designed to support farmers to produce food in, in harmony, if you like, with the environment. So doing it uh, with that in mind. Um, and I think for us, that's been a really important principle that we've taken into the scheme design. And, and hopefully that comes through in the in the actions of the scheme. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I can see there's loads of questions coming through. So um, I think it's best that we continue our walk through the document, James, and then we'll have a chance to try and look at some of the specifics that are being um, asked of, of, of you and the department. So so that's the scheme introduction. Are you ready to, to go through the scheme structure, James? Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is a it's an important um, point just to kind of talk through um, uh, how we've how we've gone about structuring the scheme. We've we've always said we wanted to put in place a, a whole farm scheme, so a scheme that uh, you know uh, recognised the uh, the farmers. Uh, um, the, f the farmer who had active management of the land and their ability to undertake actions on that land. Um, so we've designed it with three layers in mind. Uh, the, f the first being a, a universal layer of actions. And um, for those of you who have seen the document, there's a there's a kind of handy two page pull out towards the back of the document which summarizes those universal actions. Um, but really, we see that as the entry la layer to the scheme. So there's a there, there's around 12 actions in there that we'd ask farmers to undertake in exchange for a, a baseline payment. Uh, we want uh, all farmers to undertake those uh, universal actions and I'll probably talk a, a bit more about those universal actions as we go uh, into the next chapter um, uh, and we believe that they will really help farmers um, both be resilient and productive businesses through um, uh, helping them improve farm business performance um, but also to undertake as I say the delivery of some of those outcomes that I that I mentioned in in the chapter uh, the chapter before um, Above the uh, the second layer, if you like, of the scheme is a is a layer of optional actions. Um, and you know, wh when you read, I think the the list of actions, there's a there's a huge range of options that we would propose that farmers can undertake um, uh, as part of the scheme to go, uh, if you like, beyond the the universal requirements. Uh, and what we've really tried to do here is is to provide a lot of opportunity and options for farmers to do things which are right for their farm business. Now, some farmers may already be undertaking some of these option actions. Um, uh, some may have ambition to undertake them, and some it just may be the right thing for their their business to do. But what we wanted to do was provide a you know a range of opportunities to farm for farmers to. Uh, to receive further support through the scheme if they if they were willing and wanted to um, uh, undertake additional actions. So uh, again, um, uh, you know, a, a quite a lot of detail there around the optional actions that we propose, um, and and I hope some I hope there is something for most farmers to think about um, uh, in terms of what they might want to access in the future there. Uh, and then the third layer of the scheme is our is our collaborative layer, and um, and this is recognising really that the um, that there should be opportunity in the scheme for farmers to to work together to work together either at landscape or catchment scale to undertake actions which can deliver you know multiple outcomes, um, uh, and uh, you know that may be uh, delivery of for example interventions around habitat, but it could equally be uh, something relating to the supply chain. So you know where farmers might want to come together uh, to for form a cooperative for example, and to support um, local food production in that sense. So what we wanted to do for the scheme was have a vehicle for farmers to um, to collaborate and to work together, perhaps with uh, uh, other actors who are outside the scheme to deliver again uh, a multitude of, of benefits. And again, we've we've talked in the scheme a little bit about um, you know the types of collaborative actions that we would see, uh, and we've obviously been running in the Welsh government over uh, over previous years things like our sustainable management scheme, uh, which has given us a good insight into how farmers can collaborate at um, uh, you know uh, either in the supply chain or at a, a landscape scale to deliver uh, to deliver um, uh, greater outcomes. I should say that the last thing about the scheme structure, which is is really important, is it's um, we, what we what we're proposing to do is support farmers to go beyond the regulatory baseline. So, the baseline uh, regulation in Wales, uh, we we've we've termed a, we coined the phrase national minimum standards, uh, and that's an, essentially a consolidation of the existing legislation. Um, that exists in relation to agricultural practices. Uh, what we want to do is to reward farmers for going above and beyond regulation, uh, whilst at the same time um, supporting them to understand what those standards require of them, so what the law requires. So we proposed that we will consolidate um, and simplify wherever we can the existing legislation around 
um, uh, around agricultural practice into a set of national minimum standards uh, and they'll be ready in time for the scheme. I mean, in reality, you know, these are things that farmers should already be doing. It's um, we're not proposing to increase the regulatory burden on farmers here. What we're doing is seeking to consolidate the existing uh, legislation and make it easier for farmers to understand what's required of them under the law. So I think it's important to understand that scheme sits above regulation. Um, but, you know, the, the the second chapter really does deal with the structure of the scheme uh, and those and those three layers uh, of actions that farmers could undertake. And clearly when farmers are looking at these actions, and I know you're going to go into more detail when you're talking about the next chapter, one of the areas which is missing in this document is there's no payment rates. There's no indication of what level of reward they're likely to receive for compliance and, and participation in those various levels. What's the situation? When will we know a little bit more about what is the potential income streams available by the scheme? Thanks, Alad. Yeah, I, and I know um, some of the call will no doubt, no doubt be a bit disappointed that we don't include the payment rates um, in, in this publication. Um, what we have proposed is that in in um, uh, I think it's in chapter four is a baseline payment will be made um, to farmers for undertaking the universal actions we propose in the scheme. So that's a, a baseline payment on a per hectare base, uh, basis for undertaking the universal actions. What we're now in the process of doing um, is uh, is developing uh, the base for what that payment will be. So effectively looking at each of the actions that will form part of the universal layer, understanding um, you know, where there are costs for farmers to be involved, that we, um, we understand what those costs might be, understanding if there are any elements of income foregone we might need to take into consideration, uh, but crucially also understanding the social value of the outcomes that farmers will deliver as well through through delivery of those actions. So what we're what we're doing now for our evidence program is is developing really, if you like, a a payment rate on a on a uh, for the for in exchange for the universal actions, which will uh, recognise all the activity that farmers would have to undertake to to go into the scheme. And I I do recognise it's disappointing that's not in this document. Um, but equally, I think you know it was important we put out our proposals as they stand for what the actions that we'll ask farmers to do at the same time as continuing to develop the work to model those payment rates because we've got to get we've got to get it right. We've got to um, represent value for money for the for the taxpayer in the design of the scheme. But also we we you know we want to incentivise farmers to come into the scheme. So getting the payment rights right in exchange for delivery of those universal actions has been critical. So uh, our proposal on that is to consult on the payment rates at the same time as we consult on the final scheme next year. So there will be more details on that uh, uh, in the form of a formal consultation in 2023. Brilliant. Thank, th thank you, James, for clarifying that point. And I can see there's a lot of questions, so I'm keen to go make progress on the document so we can try and answer all the very valid questions which are flowing through 28 in total and on well over 100 in attendance as well, which is fantastic. So um, James, the scheme framework, I know you wanted to pick out some actions to talk through some examples um, and particularly the one around 10% tree cover, I think would would uh, would be one that our attendees would be keen to, to hear your views on. Uh, yeah, sure. I I, I think um, I I won't be able to do justice to the to this chapter because of a, a huge amount of policy development and evidence that sits underneath each and every one of the actions that are, are covered in the scheme document. But I I think what I what I might do is just pick out a couple of the universal actions just to explain a little bit about our our thinking behind them and how they sit. Uh, how they sit generally, I guess, in terms of the uh, uh, of the scheme framework, um, and you know, I, I hope um, people on the call have kind of recognised that there's a, there's a you know a multitude of different things that we're asking farmers to do for the scheme. Uh, I'll just pick out a couple maybe to begin with. Uh, one of the universal actions is to make best use of um, artificial fertiliser through nutrient management and soil testing, and this is an action really to design to support farmers to undertake. Uh, a, a range of um, soil testing on their farm. Um, you know, we think this is really important from a, a resource efficiency perspective. So um, uh, uh, helping farmers get really good information around their soils. We think it's something that a lot of farmers are already doing. You know, we know through Farming Connect that, um, you know, there's a significant amount of support already provided farm for farmers for, for, for soil testing. Uh, and we we think it will enable farmers to make um, you know better informed decisions where they're not already doing it about um, different land management practices and and particularly the application of artificial fertilizer. Uh, we also um, uh, you know from that action think that we can we can point or signpost if you like farmers to optional actions in the scheme which might benefit and support them uh, to uh, to achieve a, a, a positive outcome in relation to their. Um, 
MPK usage, for example. So um, uh, it's a good example for us of, uh, of an action which, you know, we know many farmers are already taking. I think there's a, you know, a wealth of evidence out there which supports the, you know, the benefit to the farm business of undertaking uh, nutrient management and soil testing. Um, and we believe there's, um, it, it leads farmers on a journey, if you like, to undertake additional actions which we can make available in the scheme. Um, so that's one type of optional action, uh, universal action, sorry, that um, that we've set out in our in our proposals. Uh, another one is around managing and optimizing farm performance through measuring uh, uh, and monitoring. Um, uh, and for us, this is about making sure that um, you know uh, we're supporting farmers to to uh, be resilient and productive businesses. Um, again, there's a range of evidence that suggests that the best performing farm businesses has a, have a really good understanding of uh, their costs and um, uh, 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 their input costs and uh, and obviously their their margins. And what we want to do here is is to enable farms to uh, input a simple set of data and then to make it again informed decisions um, by benchmarking that data against um, key performance indicators for the sector and we want to provide um, you know a, a simple as possible way of farmers uh, for undertaking that but really again it's it's to give better information to farmers to help them make informed decisions about either things they might want to do through the scheme or things they might want to do uh, in their business generally so those those are two types of actions in the scheme um, uh, the tree planting one I'll come to next I think um, I probably I probably dodged that one for long enough um, but there is a universal action in the scheme to create new uh, and manage existing agroforestry and woodland um, uh, and uh, the headline I think has has been around the um, uh, achieving the 10% tree cover uh, in line with the forestry standard now there's a, a number of things to say around that um, and I'll probably just start with the the context you know the, the, the climate emergency is is real and it's here um, we need to take action to respond to it. And, uh, and whilst this is one action in the scheme, and there are other actions in the scheme which are designed to help farmers reduce their emissions uh, and indeed to um, uh, sequester carbon, the, I'll point back to the action on soil testing there as a kind of avenue for how we can support farmers to sequester uh, carbon in their soil. Um, you know, tree planting is important, and uh, the Welsh Government does have a target which was set by the Independent uh, Climate. UK Climate Change Committee to plant 43,000 hectares of, uh, of trees in Wales by 2030. Um, uh, and we debated long and hard about how we framed this action. But but for us, what we want farmers in the scheme to do is to be supported to uh, increase their existing tree cover. So I think that's the first thing to say. You know, the um, we're not starting from a zero a zero sum game here. You know, many farmers already have a good uh, proportion of tree cover uh, on their farms. Our modelling of 8,000 farms would suggest that the average farm in Wales has between six and seven percent tree cover. Uh, so what we'd like farmers to do and what we will support them to do is to first of all manage that existing tree cover uh, and then to come up with a plan to how to achieve 10 percent on their farm. Um, and we really want to do this in a way which integrates, um, uh, I guess, in, in the land sharing type of approach we want, integrates um, um, uh, forestry into their farm management system. So what we've tried to do in the scheme is provide the you know a range of actions which will help farmers achieve the, the kind of right tree in the right place approach that we advocate in government. Um, and so you know whether that be um, creation of riparian buffer strips um, uh, or whether it be creating shelter belts, um, you know which um, and, and indeed shade, I guess, um, particularly relevant in this weather, uh, through integrating it into their farm management system, we'd encourage farmers to look at that um, and, and to actively support them to, um, you know, make sure they're, they're, they're they have the information available to make sure that the trees are going in the right place and support their, their farm business. Um, we, we felt it was important to include this as a universal action, not least because of the scale of the, the climate emergency challenge we face, but also to to avoid, if you like, the, the you know, the risk and something that we get uh, asked about a lot of, you know, large scale land use change in Wales with large, um, uh, you know, the, the risk, if you like, of farms being sold to um, uh, and external bodies for large scale afforestation. Uh, what we want to do um, to achieve our targets is to support farmers, existing farmers to continue farming and producing food, uh, and then also support them through payments and advice to um, to reach our targets. And that's really, you know, I'd coin this as our land sharing approach, and it, it underpins really all the design thinking that's gone into this. If we can, if we can encourage all farmers to, uh, who are part of the scheme to achieve that 10% tree cover, then, you know, the likelihood is that we won't be taking um, as much land out for large scale afforestation, which is a which I know is a real concern for the uh, uh, for the community. Um, 
I think that's probably a, a summary of some of the actions, and I'm sure mm. there's lots of questions on trees, and we might want to go into that rather than me uh, try and explain <laughs> some more. But um, but maybe I'll pause there for a sec. Yeah, thank you, James. And, and just to, to clarify, the the tree cover target of 10 percent that includes existing woodland and tree cover. It's not an additional 10 percent on top of what you already have. That's correct. So, um, um, so maintenance and creation is our is our mantra here, if you like. So, you know, what we want to do is support farmers for maintaining existing tree cover in in line with the UK forestry standard, but also support them with a range of options um, uh, to undertake uh, to it to it to increase their tree cover to at least uh, ten percent. Uh, and in by doing so, if we, as I say, if we can incentivise enough farmers to join the scheme, then you know we're confident that we'll go a long way towards achieving that target of um, forty three thousand hectares of trees in the ground by 2030. We know it's a challenge, but you know the climate emergency in itself is 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 such a challenge that you know we need to respond in that regard. And there's a question here, will the 10 percent tree cover include trees in hedgerows? So we're working through the detail of that, and I think there's a there's a, a range of different aspects of what we might need to include. But it, in summary, yes, I mean, if it's a tree uh, and if it's in a hedgerow and it's managed appropriately, um, then we'd look to include it in uh, in that 10 percent target. You know, other things that we've talked about in the policy team, which might be of interest, you know, so well managed orchards. Um, uh, you know where they're um, where they're contributing to you know tree cover obviously, but they can obviously generate a crop as well. We look to include those in the scheme. Uh, as I mentioned, um, you know the ability for farmers to create shelter belts, repairing buffer strips, and other uh, other actions as well. We we look to include in that ten percent figure. And I'm glad you mentioned orchards because there was a question about um, fruit trees uh, being included. Uh, I'm just going through the Q and eggs. I know that this has stimulated a lot of questions, and I want to make sure that we cover off uh, all the the the, um, the specifics around this. Um, bear with me as I just scroll down. Um, if the hedges count towards tree cover, is there a minimum standard to the hedge double fencing three meters, etc.? Well, there, there is an action in the scheme to create and manage uh, hedgerows. Um, the the three meter um, the three meter requirement in the scheme is actually an optional action. So there is a there's an optional action in the scheme to go beyond the the maintenance of good uh, of good hedgerows. Um, uh, you know, in essence, um, and many farmers uh, on the call will be quite familiar with you know the good standards of management that we've um, we've already got in relation to hedgerow. Um, management cycles. We, what we'd like to do is is encourage farmers to undertake that as part of the scheme, and then uh, and then if, as I say, if they wanted to go far further, where um, and I think the three meter option and um, double fencing is one of the options in there, um, then that would be an optional action that we'd support. And there's a question here: How can tenant farmers, where woodland is excluded from the tenancy and are not allowed to grow permanent crops, let alone plant trees, ever hope to qualify for the scheme? Yeah, I mentioned the tenancy working group before, and that's exactly the type of question and challenge that we're going to have to work through in our next phase of um, uh, of testing these proposals. Uh, yeah, I think we're quite clear that you know we are going to have to make some exemptions available for the universal actions we propose in the scheme. We know that there will be some. Uh, you know, covenants or um, uh, agreements which would prevent some of the actions being undertaken on on some farms for a variety of reasons, and that could be that could be relation to a tenancy agreement, or it could be, for example, in relation to a triple SI or a special area of conservation and, and restrictions which might prevent, for example, tree planting there. Um, and what we want to do is work through those um, exemptions, if you like, because we know that you know not all of the universal actions will be able to be performed by all farmers that we want to incentivise in the scheme. Um, uh, what we'd hope to do, though, is to minimise that. So, you know, we do want, um, the, you know, a set of universal actions that most farmers can undertake. But, um, you know, inevitably we have to recognise that um, uh, to encourage as many farmers into the scheme as we possibly can, there will inevitably have to be some exemptions for, for those who just can't achieve it because of restricted covenants on land and other, uh, other aspects like that. And there's a question here, will I be able to export my trees and habitat to my neighbour and let him have my and my payments for them? Um, that's a good question. Um, uh, I, uh, so it's the active management of the land that we'll be looking at. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned that we're looking at a whole farm scheme here. So it's the the whole farm that is under the active management of the of the farm business of the farmer themselves. Um, uh, 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 and the payment will be based on the um, on the amount of land in the scheme, as I said, on a per hectare basement in exchange for the universal actions. Um, you know, I guess I guess might be pointing towards um, letting arrangements or short term um, lets in some of these instances. Well, um, or land exchange. Well, obviously that would be a matter for the 
you know the individual farmer to consider about whether that would be something they would want to do um but i would say it's it you know what we've designed the scheme to, to be is a, a scheme which recognizes the active management of that land so it wouldn't just be letting um, um the forestry in this example it would be actually managing the forestry in line with uk standards which would then help achieve the 10 percent and will timber forestry be eligible as a part of the 10 percent i take that as commercial woodland uh, yes, um, um, we do talk about that as being an option. Um, you know that that may well be right for for some farm businesses, um, uh, and, and indeed, um, you know that could be an expansion or a, or a new enterprise. We do we do want to um, uh, create more um, more support for the timber industry in Wales, and if that is something that farmers wanted to undertake to achieve their ten percent, then it would be eligible. Um, and there's a point here being made: not all trees are equally valuable to wildlife. Will you be equating broadleaf with conif coniferous trees? Uh, yeah, so again, I think what we're trying to do here is provide a range of options to to enable farmers to make informed decisions around that right tree, right place approach, but also crucially what's right for their for their business. In the in this in the habitat action, um, uh, which talks about creating and supporting habitat, we recognise there will be some overlap between that universal action and the and the tree planting action. So, for example, establish broadleaf trees already uh, already in the ground. I think. Um, uh, um, for a period of, I think it's 12 years, my policy colleagues will no doubt correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, that would count towards habitat as well, whereas, you know, other, uh, some other forms of trees wouldn't count towards that habitat target as well. So again, we're very much keen to explore the detail of those kind of overlaps between the scheme actions through this period of co-design. And there's a question here from um, uh, a potential applicant that might be a cross-border farmer. If, if you're cross-border, will the 10% uh, requirement affect the whole farm or just 10 percent of your Welsh land? Yeah, I, again, a, a really good question and one that we want to tease out through our, our next um, phase of co-design. Um, um, in summary, one of one of our challenges is we can only support um, uh, agricultural activity in Wales um, uh, and, uh, you know, that means land in Wales. So um, we do recognise that poses some some particular challenges for cross border farmers in terms of how they manage their holding. We'd like to work through some of those challenges as part of co-design. And of course, it may be an area that we have to consider exemptions where, you know, a, a, you know there is obviously um, uh, activity in relation to some of those universal actions happening over the side of the border, um, which we can't recognise because it's happening in England, but which which mean it would be impractical for a, a farmer to um, to do activity on this side of the border, if you like, in line with the universal actions. So uh, it's exactly the type of point of detail that we need to work through the next stage of co-design. And there's a question here, if new trees are planted to meet the 10% requirement, can they also be sold into the carbon market? So any credits generated from that planting, could those be sold? Um, well, so I think, first of all, we'd encourage farmers to um, to seek to achieve net zero themselves before selling their, their carbon credits. Um, you know, what, one of the one of the parts of the scheme that we we haven't gone on to yet is is around a carbon assessment we'd like farmers to undertake as part of our as part of entry to the scheme. So I think I think it's really important that farmers understand what their own position is in relation to carbon before they do enter that market and they carefully consider the sale of those um, carbon credits. Um, we're looking to reward um, obviously farmers for taking actions to achieve these actions. If they then did decide to do something uh, in relation to selling those credits, um, you know, um, that would be a, a farm business decision. Um, it's a pretty complex environment though, but I would I would strongly advocate that, you know, um, farmers seek to achieve net zero on their own farm business before um, uh, potentially selling credits um, elsewhere. And I know that the tree question is generating a lot of questions, James, but we'll take one more and then I think we'll move on and then come back to some of the other questions which are coming through. But uh, th there is one comment here from one of the participants saying that uh, uh, they feel that possibly the tree, the hedgerow point hasn't been answered fully and do normal height and width hedges count as woodland. Is there more clarity you can offer on that, James? Uh, so I think in summary, no, they don't. Um, you know, they um, integrating trees into hedgerows would, um, uh, you know, we would count that towards tree cover. Um, as I said, there is a universal action around um, the maintenance of existing uh, of existing hedgerows, which we will support farmers to undertake. Um, but in essence, then, you know, hedges are not trees. And finally, just just before we move on to some other actions, the universal actions, am I right in saying you've got to comply with all of them in order to qualify for the payment? There's no option within universal. 
Yeah, so that, that's our starting point. So we'd like all farmers to undertake the universal actions that we propose in the scheme. As I say, if you're looking for a summary of that, that's right at the back of the document, the last two pages, we, we summarise what those actions are. Um, you know, we do recognise there will be some exemptions needed. And I, I, I discussed the exemption around tenancy as an example um, a, a moment ago. And I think those are the, you know, where there are restricted covenants on the land which prevent the active farmer undertaking, you know, specific specific activity on the land which would prevent their entry to the scheme if you like from undertaking because they can't undertake the action then we will look to design a, a range of exemptions around those but our, our starting point really is that all farmers should should seek to undertake the universal actions thank you um james by all means pick out some more options and more examples within chapter four if you want to and then when you're ready move on to to the scheme process in chapter five and then we'll come back to some more questions in just a moment yeah, possibly just a couple more. I mean, I think, you know, in terms of the, um, again, universal actions, there's a universal action around the animal health improvement cycle. And again, we know many farmers are already undertaking this on a on a voluntary basis and, you know, good husbandry practices uh, uh, are being undertaken in relation to the, the management of livestock. But what we really want to do is embed that into the to the scheme and support farmers to work closely with their vet on uh, on animal health and, uh, and welfare and again you know as I say um, reward them for doing so so a, a, a different type of a, um, universal action if you like to the ones we've talked about before but again one that we think is integral to um, you, know, you, you know some of the principles I set out at the beginning about what we want farmers to do to produce food sustainably high high production standards um, uh, and supporting good standards of animal health and welfare so a, a, you know a, a different type of example that we see in the universal um, uh, universal actions but again one that we want to support farmers to undertake in the future um uh, and then just maybe a, just to pick out an optional action uh, there is uh, you know as i say there is a range of optional actions in there which we've we've hoped uh, we hope will provide you know you know something for everyone really you know some opportunities for farmers to think about um you know going further than what the universal um requirements of the scheme will be uh, and which might suit their farm business um but you know a, a couple which i think have got you know a little bit of coverage in the last couple of weeks are, are some of the um the opportunities around horticulture particularly and how we can support farmers um perhaps to do some more mixed farming approaches and or diversify into more horticultural practices and i think for me that also ties into what i was saying about the you know the potential for collaborative actions as well so you know thinking about this in a from a place-based perspective are there opportunities for farmers to work together in terms of uh, creating co-ops and uh, diversifying um, some of their farm business into that space. So, I mean, that's one of many examples, but it's one that's just um, gathered quite a lot of uh, attention in the last week. So I thought I'd just highlight it now. Um, there's a couple of questions around um, livestock and there's one here. How does the aim of getting farmers to breed cattle at younger ages and finishing lamb and beef animals earlier fit with incentivising traditional native breeds, which tend to have much slower maturing? Yeah, that's a good question, and that's a bit of my wheelhouse of expertise, I'm afraid. So I might, um, I, we might have to pick that up in our in our FAQ. Um, we haven't specifically put an action in there around um, uh, around the age and the finishing um, life cycle of. Uh, uh, of livestock. What we have tried to do, as I mentioned, is um, uh, is is to try and give farmers an opportunity and support through things like the animal health improvement cycle to work with their vet to undertake actions on their farm, which which suit their their farm practice and their farm business. And we want to support farmers to undertake that. But I I know that kind of misses a question a little bit. So um, I'll undertake to to provide a response to that when I spoke to the policy team. Thank, thanks, James. Do you want to talk about the scheme process? Um, or any, yeah. any other further points before we wrap up this chapter? I know there's more questions, but let's. Uh... Yeah, if I if yeah, maybe if I just talk a little bit about process so we can obviously come back to, to, to I can see there's 60 questions now. So we've got we've got plenty to cover perhaps in the second half of the conversation. But yeah, I, I'll just pick out a few highlights from, if you like, um, the process um, chapter. And we, we did think it was important to I explain how we saw farmers both entering the scheme and what it would be like for a farmer in the scheme. Um, so first of all, the eligibility criteria, we've uh, we've we've published our proposals on that. So, um, you know, and I hope everyone on the call can see this is very much designed around um, an active farmer. So a farmer who is undertaking agriculture activities. We will define what they, we mean by agriculture activities in the in the bill. Um, but in essence, what we're talking about is, um, you know, a farmer who can perform the universal actions in the scheme. So, um, you know, the range of 12 actions that I've talked about already. Uh, we've talked about eligibility being based on three hectares of land and obviously that land um, 
of being in Wales as well. And again, this is try and make the access the scheme uh, accessible to all different types of farm in Wales um, uh, across all regions. And um, you know, we'd be really interested, I think, through our co-design process and hearing any uh, any feedback on the on the criteria. Um, the second bit about the process I just wanted to touch about on was the sustainability review. Um, I think it's fair to say this is one area that we have really um, taken on board some of the criticism, if you like, from our previous consultations and some of the, the fears expressed by the industry about the, you know, the potential uh, uh, bureaucracy and challenge this might present to farmers. So we have um, we have tried to, uh, you know, re recast our thinking on what this sustainability review is all about. Um, we think it's about, you know, um, farmers, uh, you know, basic farm information, which, you know, we as government already hold in many regards in relation to farmers who are currently part of one of our support schemes and making sure that we have good, accurate data on those farm businesses. Uh, and we also think it's about supporting farmers to undertake a, a baseline carbon and habitat review as part of entry to the scheme. And I think that's important for, for you know, many reasons, but primarily because it will provide the farmer themselves really good information about where their farm is um, in relation to carbon and habitat. Uh, it'll also provide them with information about the, you know, the opportunities that the scheme will provide them and, um, you know, uh, help help them make informed decisions on what they might want to undertake as part of the scheme. Uh, and crucially, it's really important um, information for, for government because it, um, you know, it will provide the baseline of entry to the scheme. We'd want to, uh, you know, every five years, we'd want to reassess the performance and the delivery of the scheme so we can assess, um, you know, are we delivering value for money for taxpayers? You know, are we are we making and achieving our targets in relation to the climate and nature emergencies? So um, whilst, you know, we, we've refined our proposals around this, this sustainability review, um, you know, I think we do we do recognise, you know, that it will um, it will be it will be something that will require far, some farmers, you know, particularly who might not be already undertaking, for example, a carbon assessment to do uh, to, to do work like that. But what we want to do really over the next couple of years is support farmers uh, in the best way we can to prepare for those for those assessments so we can hit the ground uh, running with the scheme. Um, uh, I just pick out um, uh, perhaps uh, uh, we've talked about payment already, so I might just talk about um, uh, monitoring and evaluation. Um, we're really keen, I think, again, through this period of co-design and um, uh, and what will follow, um, uh, you know, final decision on the scheme to understand the best ways of making sure that we can verify the actions are undertaken uh, and also we can um, support farmers, if you like, to um, to report and evaluate on what's working in the scheme and, and what might not be. Um, so we're looking um, effectively at a kind of combination of using um, technology to support us in our monitoring and evaluation, uh, you know, uh, farmer information and the provision of information from farmers to support in terms of the monitoring of the scheme uh, and, and you know, where, wherever possible, um, um, some minimising of, you know, boots on ground, for want of a better word, to um, to evaluate the performance of the scheme and to, to verify the payments. We're really keen to kind of work through our universal actions in terms of the best way of doing that. Um, I'm really keen, I think, to, to look at things like, um, uh, uh, as I say, technology, which could perhaps support both the farmer uh, and government in making that as an efficient process as possible. Um, I probably just maybe just come back to one um, one point on on payment, which I which I possibly miss. So, you know, uh, one thing that we we want to do is to provide farmers with. Um, as I say, the optional actions for the scheme and, and, and uh, a question that we've been asked quite a lot is will that include capital works um, for gra um, or grant um, availability? Um, and, and yes, it is my summary there. So there are a range of optional actions we propose in the scheme where the support that we might provide to a farmer would be through a provision of a grant or a capital grant for infrastructure. So I, I realised I missed that earlier, Alex, sorry. So before I just come back to that. Brilliant, thank you, James. And Farming Connect is mentioned quite a lot of times in that scheme process and providing support in all the various stages. How do you see the role of Farming Connect in, in the future? Yeah, thanks, Alid. Um, yeah, so uh, we um, we see Farming Connect having a key role really as being the government's advisory service and support service for uh, farmers in the future. So. Uh, um, what we will be doing, you know, if, if you like Farming Connect is the Welsh government brand for um, advice at the moment, what we will be doing is repositioning the support provided through Farming Connect to uh, support farmers in terms of their entry into the scheme, uh, uh, the information, the knowledge transfer, 
the continuous professional development that they undertake as part of that entry to the scheme. So I think the current contract for Pharma Connect was let something like seven years ago. Um, um, you know, we're, we're obviously moving into a new phase of what we're going to want that service to provide. Um, so we're keen, I think, again, to um, to, to refocus um, um, the support that's provided through Pharma Connect um, uh, and direct it towards helping farmers uh, achieve the outcomes that we want through the scheme. Thank you, James. I can see there are some questions around the piloting, so probably that leads us quite nicely to talk about the transition and then we can um, go through all the questions that we haven't addressed so far and I'm sure there's some more more to come up to 68 at the moment. So um, does that um, sort of lead us quite nicely, James, to, to talk about the, the final chapter, chapter six on the transition? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, yeah, probably useful to finish the walkthrough and then we can get into you know uh, you know what looks like a really good a good range of questions. Excuse me. Um, so uh, so we've we've put a couple of things in here which I, I think it's worth highlighting. First of all, we talk about um, uh, what will happen between now and the first of April 2025. So we're calling that period, you know, our prepare and pilot period, if you like. So what we want to do is to help. Prepare farmers for the scheme, and you know, publication of that this document, the process of co-design that I've talked about. They, they are deliberate, you know, decisions to help prepare farmers for what the scheme will look like in 2025. Uh, we also want to do, as I said, some work around supporting them with things like the carbon assessment and habitat reviews over the next couple of years. So, you know, the more of that that we can do in the next couple of years, the more uh, we can support farmers to be ready to enter the scheme in in 2025. And we want to pilot some of the. Uh, pilot some of the various aspects of the scheme as well, pilot some of the processes uh, and pilot some of the actions as well to ensure that they're delivering the types of outcomes that we're seeking. Um, and part of that, again, is really part of it. I, I was going to say part of this co-design process. We want to test, if you like, the deliverability and practicality of what's in the scheme and, uh, you know, on the ground and we want to work with farmers to uh, to test that over the couple of the next couple of years. Uh, and we will do that through um, partly through the um, uh, support already being provided for, through Pharma Connect, and uh, you know we'd look to Pharma Connect to provide support to do that over the next couple of years, but also through uh, um, the £227 million of domestic funding that the uh, the minister announced in April as support for uh, for the rural sector. What we'd like to do is use use some of that money, if you like, to prepare farmers for entry to the scheme and to pilot some of the processes. So very much our focus in the next couple of years is there. Um, the second part of the chapter talks about transition and um, and this is, if you like, transition out of the basic payment scheme, the EU um, Common Agricultural Policy Scheme into the Sustainable Farming Scheme. And we've proposed in the document a transition period that starts on the 1st of April 25 uh, and ends on the 31st of March 29, a multi-year transition phase to encourage and incentivise farmers into the scheme, whilst at the same time recognising that we don't want to create a financial cliff edge um, for any farmer actually who's currently receiving support. So, um, so we've committed to ensuring that a stability fee, uh, stability payment will uh, be a, a feature of the scheme during the transition period. So right through that transition period, so that we can avoid any uh, financial cliff edges. Again, we'll consult on our final proposals for that uh, in 2023, alongside the final scheme and alongside the payment rates. Um, so I, th I think that really covers uh, the transition chapter. And I think, you know, what we try to do here is to give as much certainty as we can um, about what what government intends to do over the next, uh, uh, you know, over the next seven years, in essence. So it's, a, you know, I, I do recognise it's quite a long term plan. Um, and, you know, there is an absolute commitment there to providing more detail and information, particularly about payments, um, as I said, in the consultation next year. You mentioned certainty there um, the certainty around the BPS for this year and 2023, the, the new scheme is intended to start in 2025. It leaves a bit of a question mark about 2024. Is there any budget um, certainty for, for 2024? Yeah, the um, so we do have an indicative budget for 2024, which has been published and, you know, that um, uh, that is still an indicative budget because it has to be voted through um, by the Senate. Um, this year's budget has been. Um, Minister was keen to give that certainty to farmers in, in what are really uncertain times. And, you know, I guess it's in contrast to, you know, what might be happening over the border, border in England, particularly at the moment with um, you know, reductions in BPS payments currently ranging from 20 to 40 percent. 
Um, you know, I, we think it was the right thing to do. We've, we've taken a made in Wales approach to this policy. We're designing a whole farm scheme as opposed to some, you know, a, a different approach they're taking in England, designing free schemes and multiple entry points. Um, uh, and we thought it would provide that stability and our opportunity to talk to farmers and, and co-design, if you like, the next stage of, uh, of our proposals there. We recognise there's a gap at the moment in 2024. Um, you know, we haven't provided advice and, um, uh, and have had a conversation with the minister about what we might want to do there. You know, there is a lot going on um, at the moment, of course, uh, in relation to um, uh, prices um, uh, and, and the need for um, stability wherever possible, particularly in relation to the agriculture sector. So, you know, we will be uh, we will be talking to the minister uh, uh, about that um, in the near future and um, you know, be able to hopefully confirm um, an approach to that, um, you know, certainly this this year, I would hope. Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much. And I just want to um, now pick up on some of the questions. Great to see so much interaction on the Q&A. So uh, thank you very much for everybody who's asking questions. We are going to try and get through uh, as much of them as we can now. And thank you, James, for, for going through the walk through what is a 70 page document, trying to get through as much as we, as we can uh, over the past uh, hour or so. Right. There is, um, bear with me, I we've covered off a lot of the tree questions, but um, I want to pick up on a few here. Bear with me just a second so I can try and make sure we haven't missed any. Um, there was one about um, piloting and how soon is that going to begin and how are you going to select the farms to take part in that process? Yeah, so um, we, some of the pilot schemes um, are, are already well in, in underway in development. So um, I hate to come back to tree planting, but we will be introducing or launching a, uh, a you know, a, a small woodland creation scheme uh, in the in the near future. And it's exactly that type of thing that we want to do to pilot the types of approaches we talked about in the scheme documents. So um, that'll be uh, open to farmers. So um, those who want to participate in it, it won't be. Uh, it will be dependent on budget in terms of selection process. So for each of these schemes, there will be criteria um, that, that are assessed against. Um, but, you know, for those interested, we'd, we, we'd like to make available, if you like, as much as we can uh, in that regard. So that's that's one example. Um, you know, for me, one of the one of the key things we want to, uh, as I said, to prepare and support farmers for is the, the carbon and habitat review assessments that I that I talked about as part of the sustainability review. I don't think we'll be kicking that work off until uh, the next financial year. So after April 2023. Uh, but what we really want to do there is to um, to ensure that we have a, a you know, a mechanism for supporting farmers to undertake those assessments, which is which is practical. So we'll be looking for, you know, a good number of farmers to contribute to that. But again, what we'll look to do is to open up selection criteria to that so that um, and publish that so that farmers can understand if it's right for them. Thank you. There's a question here about the 10% um, target for semi natural habitat. What is it? What things uh, in terms of what sorts of things are you asking farmers to do is uh, in essence the question. OK, so um, in many ways, again, this is, um, you know, I talked about the habitat um, baseline review. What we would like to do is understand the, the extent, the type and the quality of, of habitat in Wales as part of that review. Uh, and then, you know, obviously support farmers to manage the existing habitat on their land. Uh, uh, that's been identified through that review. And so, you know, focusing first on the priority habitat um, uh, or bringing um, uh, habitat uh, under management where it's in a triple SI or special area of conservation um, and has an active management plan, we'd like to support farms to do that. Um, you know, and if that achieved the 10%, then 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 great, you know, where and there will be a number of farms in Wales that obviously where that is possible, they already are managing habitat. Uh, priority habitat and they're managing it in a good way and we want to support them to continue doing that. Uh, where it's not, um, there's a specific scheme action about, um, you know, different things again, you know, similar to the trees in many ways, different things that a farmer could undertake, options they could undertake if you like to create uh, semi-natural habitat. So the type of intervention we're talking about there is um, uh, uh, um, Hay, uh, hay meadows, um, we're talking about wildflowers, we're talking about beetle banks, uh, we're talking about using margins of field to create new habitat. Um, again, this is where I think the, the review is really important. So to understand the opportunity on the individual farm and also to, you know, to give options, if you like, for what different farmers might want to undertake in that regard. So there's a there's a number of kind of options in there that we've kind of set out in the document, but they're not exhaustive. Um, you know, there will be a range of different things that a farmer could undertake to to achieve those targets. 
Thank you, James. We're jumping about a bit in terms of question topics here because I'm just scanning down the list, but I know you can handle it, James. Um, is there a list publicly available of all the stakeholders that have been consulted up until now? Uh, it, yes, so I think I think um, I'm right in saying that on our consult on our free consultations that each of them would have um, included a, a consultation response and a report, and that would have listed those um, stakeholders who responded. Um, uh, you know, as I say, we um, as part of our you know regular engagement with stakeholders, we meet with um, you know various organisations around Wales on a very regular basis. So I, I don't think we actually have a list of that. But those who have formally responded to consultations, they would I believe they'll be published on our website. There's a quote here in one of the questions. Farmers will contribute to our target for 30% <clears throat> of land, excuse me, to be protected for nature by 2030. Does this mean you'll be asking um, farmers to put in another 10% on top of the 20% for trees and habitat? No. Um, so the, the two universal actions in the scheme, um, and recognising there may be some overlap between those as we've talked about already, the two universal actions is one for 10% tree cover, so maintenance of existing tree cover and creation of new where it's below 10%, um, and maintenance of habitat um, uh, where it's below 10%, uh, creation of new. So those are those are the two actions we wouldn't be asking for another 10%. Thank you, James. Um, there's a focus on establishing herbal lays, according uh, um, to, to one of the participants questions. There's a focus on establishing herbal lays, understandably, but shouldn't permanent lays which don't need to be ploughed and reseeded be equally rewarded for their species diversity appropriate to that particular area or reward them for setting seed and flowering, which is why the herbal lays are rewarded. Many areas are restricted in reseeding due to EIA uh, requirements. Yeah, uh, again, probably a little bit outside my comfort zone and expertise in relation to permanent lays, I'm afraid. Um, my my sense is it may well be um, something that we would reward through the scheme where, it, uh, as you say, where it does um, um, create uh, habitat or it does uh, support some of the outcomes that we'd um, that we'd want to see, um, you know, for example, no bare soil. Um, so uh, my sense is it is something, but I probably will have to plead the fifth there and um, respond to that question in a and a just to check with the policy team. Yeah. That's fine. There's a question here. What would Welsh Government's advice be on um, given the unprecedented pressure on spiralling costs currently? What should farmers prioritise the cost of meeting NVZ reg regulations or the potential cost of meeting the requirements of this new scheme? Well, I, I'd say this scheme is uh, the scheme is about providing support to farmers. So, you know, this is a, a payment that we're proposing to make to farmers for uh, uh, you know, for undertaking the actions in the scheme, it, it's voluntary in that sense. Um, uh, and we need to make sure that the payment rate that we set incentivizes farmers to participate in the scheme because we're only going to get the outcomes that we that we want as government if farmers um, you know want to come in the scheme. So, you know, we have to get the balance right, if you like, between incentivizing farmer participation in the scheme and, you know, agreement to undertake the actions that we're asking them to undertake um, a, 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 and, um, you know, the value for money perspective in relation to the, to, to the use of public money. So, um, so I think I, I think for me it's about um, you know what we need to do is is um, present a scheme that can that you know the the farmers want to be part of that they can recognise the support the you know the long term support that um, we can provide to farm businesses uh, through a regular income stream from government. We talked about um, multi year up to five year contracts as part of the scheme, which could be a you know a significant source of farm income. We've talked about things that farmers might want to go beyond, if you like, in terms of optional actions that we think will be good to support their business to be resilient and productive as well. So, um, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't see this as an overhead to farmers. I would say this is an opportunity for farmers personally, because this is about creating a, a scheme which will support the actions that many are already undertaking. And, and linked to the issue about spiralling input costs, there's, there's a question here that it's um, and a comment. It's great to see farmers will be supported to grow crops which lower the amount of feed they buy in. How will the scheme support farms to grow such crops for use on other farms in Wales? Um, i.e. if one farm doesn't have the land suitable for growing such crops, how could the scheme support collaborative approaches between farms so one that can grow could be supported to supply another that cannot? Yeah, well, I, I think you, the, the word there is collaboration and we we very deliberately designed the collaborative layer to be fairly flexible so that we can look at, you know, proposals that are coming from farmers, which will enable exactly that type of collaboration to take account of. I mean, we want to uh, we want to encourage um, farm businesses to operate within the natural capacity of their land, um, uh, you know, and I think, you know, understanding the dynamics, if you like, particularly in, uh, you know, between 
farms who um, you know probably border or are very close to bordering each other I think you know the opportunity for collaboration could be significant there so we've deliberately kind of kept those kind of questions open in terms of what might be the right support to provide for collaboration and as I talked about into that supply chain question if you like you know we do recognize that could be intervention at a landscape scale in, in in terms of specific land management practice but it could also be um, working together to produce food for a local market etc to go into a production and I think I hope there's enough in the scheme that people can see the opportunities for collaboration as well as undertaking individual actions for their farm business. Uh, there's a question here which um, touches upon the, the situation should a farmer decide not to participate so what's the government's position for farmers that choose not to enter the scheme? Yeah, so I mean, I'm I'm sure there will be some. We we want to, as I said, incentivise participation in the scheme. The you know the delivery of outcomes is dependent on farmers um, uh, joining the scheme. Um, for those farmers who don't, of course, we've we've said we'll phase out the basic payment scheme um, from the period 2025 to 2029. So you know there will be no basic payment scheme in Wales. We propose um, uh, after the 31st of March. 2029 um, you know those uh, those farm businesses therefore who currently receive um, payment through that scheme would, would would not be receiving it in in the future thereafter um, but you know as I say for me it's more about incentivizing farmers into the scheme making it you know worth their while from a financial um, perspective um, to support them to be resilient and productive businesses and recognizing actually that there's there's a whole range of different actions in the scheme that we think will support the, the farm business to be um, economically resilient uh, uh, rather than you know saying that we well we don't want farmers to be in the scheme because um, it'll save the government money that's not what we're about we're about trying to encourage farmers to produce food sustainably because we recognize its importance to our nation and the rural communities that, in which farms serve alongside um, taking action against the climate and nature emergencies and following on from your point about financial incentives, there's a question here that although we are awaiting the economic analysis, which will inform the payment rates, are you confident that even if the overall scheme budget, whatever it ends up being, will be sufficient to support the 12 universal actions and have significant funds to support the optional and collaborative um, levels layers as well? Yeah, uh, uh, it's a really good question. It's um, and it's important, I think, that we go back to the evidence here. So what uh, you know, and it's a really important part of our job in government is to be providing evidence about the use of public money. So um, I think we've got a really robust evidence base now that supports the, the universal actions and indeed all the actions that we propose in this scheme document. Um, and, and we know that, um, you know, there's a huge opportunity for the, the sector in Wales to play, you know, a significant to make a significant contribution against our um, our climate and nature emergency. So, so really, I think what I'm trying to say is, you know, if you uh, if if we can make a really robust argument for supporting farmers through this scheme um, by justifying the cost of those interventions that we're proposing in the scheme and demonstrating how it's supporting Welsh society and taxpayers in tackling, you know, you know, the number one priority for this government, then I think we've got a really good case to say, well, this is the budget that's going to be required to do that. Now, you know, that, you know, it, like in any other budget settlement, that'll be up in competition against, you know, a budget for the health service, a budget for education, a budget for local government. Um, but for me, um, and, and in many ways, the job of my team is to provide that really robust evidence for the continued support that's provided by government, because we recognise that, um, you know, um, the difference the sector can make in relation to the climate and nature emergencies. Now, my next question takes us slightly off scheme. Uh, and this is in relation to the regulatory baseline, the national minimum standards you referred to earlier. And uh, there's a question here, when do you hope to consult on the national minimum standards? Yeah, so um, I'd probably, if, if people on the call haven't had a chance to see it yet, we did publish our proposals for national minimum standards in, in the agriculture white paper. So we have already consulted on our on our proposals for those standards. Uh, as I say, this is not about um, increasing the regulatory burden, it's about simplifying and making it proportionate. The existing um, domestic regulation um, for agriculture in Wales is about, it's about understanding that it's a quite a complex mix of EU and UK legislation at the moment and creating a simpler set of standards around it. So we, we have already consulted on that. It was in our white paper in 2020. You can, you know, that's available again on our website if you want to have a look at the, uh, firstly, the consultation and also the government's response the consultation. Thank you James. There's a quite specific question here regarding the Carnevae ponies. Uh, will farmers looking after rare Carnevae ponies be rewarded for their work as a part of the new scheme? That's probably a level of detail we haven't got to on our scheme design yet I um, I expect but um, again I'll, we'll take that question away I think particularly to, to, to um, um, uh, respond to it through a, a, a later Q&A if that's okay. 
Uh, there's a question about the compliance and enforcement of the scheme. I know there's a lot of mention about proportionality in, in scheme penalties in the document. Uh, to what extent has that process been de developed? Um, is it right to assume, the question is here, there's a system of advisory notes followed by enforcement action, followed by court action for severe breaches. So how well advanced is your thinking around uh, monitoring and, and um, managing potential breaches? Yeah, I, I get a really good question, I, and I probably failed to mention this, but I, you know what we'll be supporting farmers for undertaking is the action that they've agreed as part of either universal action or optional action, and and you know we recognise that there may be then circumstances outside the farmer's control which would not deliver the outcome that we're seeking. So you know, for example, extreme weather could um, uh, could be a reason why um, you know whilst the farmer's undertaken done their bit, if you like, of undertaking the thing that we wanted, it you know they're prevented from doing it. By um by circumstances outside the control, and in those cases, obviously, we would continue to support the farmer because they've undertaken what they've agreed to undertake. Um, we want to have a proportionate system in relation to penalties, and you know, again, this is understanding that um, you know, we want farmers to be part of the scheme and feel comfortable delivering the actions as part of that scheme. Um, it, essentially, it, it won't be tied to the law, so it would be very unlikely that we'd be taking court action unless there was a you know some kind of fraudulent claim or something coming through the scheme. Um, what we'd want to do, I think, is work with farmers to understand you know the difficulty in discharging any actions they've agreed to undertake uh, or where they haven't uh, been able to um, rather than having this kind of you know slightly punitive system of payment and clawback just to agree with farmers a variation to the contract so for example you know if you're looking at a five-year contract we know that things might change from a farm business perspective in the five years I think every year we want to to you know to do some basic verification with the farmer around you know the land under control the types of actions they've undertaken the monitoring of those actions uh, and it may be that, that when we look ahead then to the next year that the farmer themselves may, may want to make some changes because they recognize that you know the world has changed for them or their priorities may have changed so we want to make sure that within a kind of you know a long-term commitment if you like to undertake these actions there is some flexibility for both parties but you know i think scheme penalties may be necessary where you know obviously you know very small proportion of farmers who are in the scheme um, may not um, um, undertake the actions and therefore you know shouldn't really be paying them for them uh, the document also mentions testing soils, James, for, for nitrogen and carbon. Um, there's a question saying this is expensive, so is the Welsh Government going to pay for the costs? Would we have to get every field tested? And what is the point of testing for nitrogen, which is uh, very changeable? So. Yeah, good, uh, good question. Yeah, so I mean, the, the action is to, you know, um, to undertake soil testing. We um, we have got to do a kind of proportionality check here, both from a farm business perspective and also from a government perspective um, in terms of, you know, what, you know, how many parcels of land would we ask a farmer to undertake? Um, and, and I think that's one of the types of questions we'd want to we'd want to kind of go through in co-design. There are also different ways of testing and some are slightly more challenging than others. So I think, again, we'd want to test the, um, you yeah. On the pun. We want to test the, the best way of asking farmers to undertake or discharge this universal action. But yeah, I mean, it is something that we'd look to um, support farmers to through the scheme. So we will be building in the cost of that testing, if you like, to the baseline payment that we'd make farmers. So, you know, we recognise that there's a, you know, a benefit to their, you know, potentially to the farm business as well as, um, you know, to the actions that they want to undertake. But, you, you know, we, we think it's part of supporting farmers to be uh, resilient and productive. Um, so I think the level of detail we're going to go into there, that's exactly the type of question we want to test in in the co-design period process. I, I should just say on that, you know, so I, I don't know if um, people on the call have registered, but we, we're actively seeking um, you know, people to sign up for co-design now. So if you are interested, I'm sure we, one of my colleagues will post a link about how to sign up for co-design. We'd really welcome your thoughts and we'll be running surveys, interviews and workshops over the summer and autumn period to encourage people's views and uh, and to seek feedback on you know, on precisely that type of question. Uh, and there's been a lot of questions around the soil testing and, and I suspect this is something that's going to be picked up in detail in the FAQs and, and, and more information to follow. There's a question here about the, the length of contracts on offer, uh, particularly in relation to some of the actions around tree planting and tree management might ne necessarily be 50 years or more. Um, how will the Welsh Government support actions which are potentially very long term for the contracts, you know, presumably are three or five years? 
Yeah, so we've we've talked we've proposed a, a maximum kind of length for contracts of five years um, uh, as part of these proposals, uh, as part of the scheme publication proposals, um, and, and we're aiming really there to get a bit of flexibility for the you know. So when I say a five year contract, I I think what we mean by that is a uh, you know as I just talked about some flexibility within that five year period to recognise that things may change. You know, so the, the, for example, the land under active management might change because of a, a, a you know a new a, a new parcel land being taken on by the farmer or released. By the farmer. Well, we'd want to reflect that in the contract. Uh, we'd want to reflect, I think, a schedule of actions which we agree with the farmer to undertake over that period. So, you know, uh, we, you know, we don't expect farmers to have planted the 10% of trees on day one. We we expect that to take place during the period of that of that five-year contract. Um, uh, and we also would want to, you know, wherever possible, enable farm businesses to come in and um, say, well, actually, you know, there might be some other optional actions that I can now undertake on my farm business, say, three years into a contract, and so seek a variation to to go uh, to go further or to gain government support through that. Uh, and I think we think that's about right. Um, uh, I think, you know, obviously um, there are, you know, I think there are arguments both ways about whether you have shorter contracts, but we're worried there that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily see the delivery of outcomes. I think there are some problems inherent with with longer than five year contracts as well in terms of um, flexibility that might be presented to farmers. Um, uh, but what we what we would like to do, I think, is is ensure there's enough flexibility in, in a, say, a five year contract for us to, to have some variations and for the farmer, you know, to recognise that changes happen and um, to enable them to reflect that in their in their agreement with the Washgov. Public access is the topic we're going to tackle next. And there's a question here. Why are there no universal actions linked to the management of existing public access and rights of way? Most farms have paths and many existing paths are either blocked or unusable in breach of statutory duties. Surely this scheme is a chance to get the network network up to scratch as well as enhancing it. I think that I think the answer to that probably lies in the question. I mean, um, if they are um, points of access and public access, which is, uh, you know, farmers are under regulation to maintain, then they should be maintained. What we've always said through this scheme is we're not we're not paying farmers or supporting farmers to um, to to uh, undertake their regulatory activity, if you like. Um, this is above and beyond that. So there is a specific action in the scheme around enhancing access. So, you know, we recognise that, you know, for example, removal of styles and installation of uh, of, of, of different entry uh, gates, for example, or uh, or in enhancing the kind of experience of via signing. So that, that is something that we would not want to support for the scheme, but we wouldn't support farmers for undertaking what is also already a statutory requirement of them. Thank you, James. Uh, moving on to young farmers and new entrants, uh, this uh, participant has said there's no mention of any scheme which will be targeting support of young farmers and new entrants explicitly. Is this still on the table? Uh, so at this stage, no. Um, the sustainable farming scheme is our is our um, uh, if you like our, our flagship replacement for the basic payment scheme, and, and what we want to do is support farmers. Uh, all types of farmers um, through incentivising participation in the scheme in the future. I think I, I mentioned at the beginning that we kind of recognise that how do we encourage new entrants or, or younger farmers into uh, into farming practice? I think there's a perennial challenge there. We do want to establish a small working group to look at the specific issue about how the scheme can incentivise or hang, can support, sorry, um, uh, young farmers into the scheme, um, uh, recognising really that you know, succession is a, a again a bit of a perennial issue in farming. Sorry, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat. So maybe on to the next question. I'll come it's back all to right. That. Yeah. Um, moving on to carbon toolkits, and there's a question here asking what carbon toolkit will the Welsh government be using? As many farmers are already monitoring their carbon sequestration on different toolkits, uh, and there's various different formulas out there. What is the uh, accepted standard the Welsh government will be using? Yeah, uh, recognise that, and uh, our objective in the scheme is to make this a bit simpler for farmers by saying, well, these are the, these are what we want you. These are the this is the information we want you to provide, and these are the systems that you can use to provide it. Um, you know, I think the farming unions have done a really good piece of work in in terms of looking at what's out there on the market already and and narrowing down, if you like. Um, uh, you know the different types of tools that are available to farmers to a, to a smaller selection so that's all already available. We've undertaken to work with the unions, farming unions over the next couple of years and the Young, Young Farmers Association actually in, on, a, uh, on, a, on a process of really understanding how we can get to a position where we have a simple set of requirements for this um, 
carbon uh, baseline that we can then go out and either um, use existing tools or if we need to develop our own to say to all farmers in the scheme well he here's the tool we'd recommend you use for the scheme um, you know uh, we think it's proportionate to, to your needs if you already have information this is how you can input that information into this tool and to make it as simple as you can if you like to to have that earned recognition through that so um, when I said about preparing farmers um, that's really the type of work we want to do over the next couple of years narrow down that field make it really clear about exactly what we want the tool um, we want we want the assessment to say and also the tools that we know that can provide that yeah, having that industry standards in terms of measuring carbon is something that's come up with a number of questions. Yeah. Um, so apologies, we're probably not going to pick up on each and every single one of them, but it is it is something uh, I'm sure your your team are working very hard at looking into. Um, there is one I'd like to pick up on, however, if if you are carbon negative uh, on a carbon calculator, why do you still need to have 10 percent tree cover? An interesting take. Well, congratulations, um, first of all, um, uh, you know, for, for achieving that. I think it's no no mean feat. Um, um, I, well, um, so I, th I think what we would say is um, we w we are looking to share the load of the, the creation of tree cover on a Wales basis. So, you know, I, I mentioned our um, our target around tree cover in, uh, in Wales, uh, 43,000 hectares by 2030. Um, as I say, we want all farmers who participate in the scheme to, to contribute to that rather than kind of loading it in certain areas of Wales or loading it in terms of certain farms or indeed leading to large scale land use change. And that's really the reason why we've included it as a universal action because we want all farmers to undertake it. Yeah. Um, there's a comment and, and a point made here about net zero is most easily achieved by reducing ruminant livestock, but methane is a short lived greenhouse gas. Will this be factored into the carbon calculating um, calculation to prevent livestock farming vanishing from the Welsh landscape? Um, yeah, I think it has to be, doesn't it? I mean, I think, you know, as, as we've talked about, there are many different carbon assessments out the moment uh, out there at the moment. Um, you know, some are uh, simpler to undertake, some are more complex. There's a varying degrees of what they're reporting back to farm businesses. I think our job as government is to say, if it's a requirement for us to create a baseline, these are the types of things that we want you to measure. This is the types of information you'll have to input into the carbon, into that carbon assessment. And here's the tool that we'll we'll use to, to, to help you provide that. Um, as I say, that's exactly the type of thing I think we want to test um, over the next couple of years, working with the farming unions as well, um, you know, to develop a carbon assessment for Wales where we can establish a really robust baseline and then we can measure our progress against that over over a number of years. Mm. Uh, there's a question about scheme process and, and application and um, will farmers have to use Farming Connect services for advice to apply for the scheme? Some farmers may be able to do it themselves um, without the need for support. So is the Farming Connect element a mandatory component or an optional um, support service? Yeah, uh, we. I think what we've tried to do is to make it as accessible as we can to farmers, recognising that some may need little or no support in in undertaking the things we propose as part of that process. And if that's the case, um, you know, very happy for the farmers to to apply um, uh, based on their own, you know, carbon assessment using the tools <coughs> we provide and um, uh, and the habitat review, um, verifying the information. That's um, that's fine. We've tried to design the scheme so that you know farmers can. Uh, undertake as much of that as possible with as minimal support as possible. But I think, you know, we've got to recognise that we're dealing with a, you know, like any society, a, a spectrum of um, uh, of the sector that will need more support and we want to make that available to them. But if a farmer can do it themselves and they're confident to do it themselves, then uh, yeah, of course they could uh, apply for the scheme themselves. Now, there's a real sense of ambition in this next question. How confident are you that RPW Online can be synchronised with the existing data submission in through EID Cymru, BCMS, FOWL, existing carbon calculators, supermarket contract data requirements, etc. This is a big opportunity for more efficient data capture. I couldn't agree more. I think there's a real opportunity here to we've got to design a system that is useful for government and to the farm business. Um, you know, so um, what we want to do is capture information and then play it back to, you know, I talked about benchmarking earlier. So if we are capturing information, we then need to be play it, play it back to the farmer in a usable way um, where they're already capturing information. We need to ensure that it's as simple as, a, you know, for example, through farm contracts of uh, uh, or existing assessments. We need to make it as simple as possible for that data to be inputted into whatever government requirement we wanted. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think there's a huge opportunity here for us to develop and, and you know, refine, you know, what is already, I think, a really good online system into something which is, you know, um, even more beneficial to an individual farmer. And also, crucially, I think, takes some of that bureaucracy 
if you like, out of the kind of monitoring and evaluation as we talked about already. And there's a couple of questions about supporting horticultural enterprises. Um, specifically, the three hectare limit will still exclude a lot of farms, particularly horticulture, which can be commercially successful with less than a hectare. If you wanted to be open to all farmers, why not have the same eligibility based on evidence of running a commercial business, as was the case with the recent horticulture grants? Yeah, I think I, uh, so co we want to test that in co-design eligibility particularly, and we do recognise particularly for horticulture, the free hectare um, requirement might be a might be a barrier. So we'd, we'd like to explore that more. Uh, what we've what we've tried to do in the scheme is to say that, of course, if you're a, a you know, a, a farmer with less than three hectares, you could collaborate, um, you know, so there would be opportunities to collaborate. But, um, you know, I think again, as really, that's probably the one issue that we were we have been debating long and hard in terms of setting eligibility criteria. We've got to try and find a balance, I think, between, you know, encouraging all um, f farm types and um, uh, across all regions in, in Wales to, to be entering the scheme with the administration of what could be a very complex scheme otherwise. But if there are some ideas on eligibility criteria that you know would enable those very small scale, uh, in terms of land mass anyway, horticulture enterprises to participate, we'd, we'd really like to hear from you. And um, following on from that question, there's a, there's a specific one around the capacity and capacity within farming connected to deliver all the support uh, which is stated within the document uh, and also as a follow on there's a question saying why isn't any other support service provider being considered? Well farming connect is a Welsh government brand so um, you know it, it's how we brand our support so it isn't about a particular service provider uh, as I've said I think it's, it'll be a very much refocused farming connect um, you know there will be um, you know a new co new contract if you like or new contracts that will be let to provide all the support that we need through that service so it's not about saying it's a particular provider or anything like that it's about saying well as a brand we you know we think farming connect um, uh, you know has, has achieved a lot over recent years uh, we'd like to continue that brand but we'd like to change the way that it supports farmers particularly in relation to entry to the scheme yeah thank you a couple of questions picking up on the importance of food production and food security one asking will farmers be penalized for being intensive uh, are you not worried about food security and food production as you're actively encouraging farmers to reduce food production we live in dangerous unpredictable times and farmers are warning there's going to be food shortages so given the very real pressures we're seeing here and now today how is that being considered in scheme development yeah, very much so. Um, so uh, what we've trying to do is design, a, you know, a scheme both for current farmers, but also recognising the need to look after and, and ensure we do have a sustainable um, future for the agriculture sector in Wales. And I think, you know, the, the, the biggest risk to food security in the medium to long term is the climate emergency. So, you know, uh, we have to take action now if we are to ensure that in uh, 10, 15, 25 years time, um, given predictions and actually recent weather patterns that we do have a, a, you know, a sustainable opportunity for the sector in Wales. So we're trying to balance, if you like, the needs of the current with the future generation. You know, food production is essential to this to this scheme. You know, we, we it is a complementary aim to what we're we're trying to achieve. I, you know, I think if you look behind some of the headlines in terms of the scheme actions, there is plenty in there which, you know, plenty of actions in there which are designed to support the farm business to produce food in a sustainable manner and make, um, you know, good decisions to be uh, uh, support them to be as resource efficient as they can to minimise their uh, both uh, input costs and environmental. Um, um, consequences of any of those input costs as well. So I think what we've tried to do is take that into consideration of the scheme. I think the food security debate, you know, is obviously brought into sharp focus because of the um, uh, the conflict in the Ukraine, um, you know, and it is uh, very much at the forefront of uh, ministers' minds at the moment, um, you know, and, and I think it's been great in Wales that we've maintained stability both this year and next year in terms of the continuation of BPS. I think that's a, you know, that's a real sign of the commitment to supporting the industry in, in difficult times. The um, I guess my question on food security is almost a, a playback is that we've got to be really clear about what we mean by food security. Are we talking about maintaining the status quo um, uh, in, in terms of what's produced here in Wales and how the nation in Wales is fed? Or are we talking about moving to a, a different system of um, pr production, uh, processing and consumption in the future? Uh, and I think, again, there's some opportunities in the scheme and I've, I've talked about mixed farming. We've talked about horticulture a bit. There is an, there are opportunities in this scheme, I think, particularly to think about, well, what actually does food security mean in the context of our nation and what we should be producing here? And so we, we're hoping, I think, to provide opportunities for farmers to to kind of 
of recognise that, if you like, through the scheme by diversifying um, whilst continuing to you know, support their main enterprises. So we talk about mixed farming, we talk about horticulture, there's other opportunities in there for uh, optional actions. But no, I, I think it's a really important question. It, it, it's flown through all of our design principles, as I said, about keeping farmers on the land, recognising the importance of food production to the nation and recognising that we need a strong, viable farm business, which is economically viable, I should say, uh, in order to deliver the environmental outcomes that we're seeking as well. It's a very live debate at the moment, I'm sure it's going to come up in a number of conversations you're going to have and face to face conversations as well over the coming uh, weeks and months. Now we're hour and a half into this live session and I'm, fair play to James, I'm firing questions from all angles at him and he's had barely a chance to take a breath. Uh, we do have a cut off at eight o'clock, so we, we'll continue. If you're happy, James, we'll, we'll continue. And, Absolutely. Uh, Work, work our way through the questions, 105 in total, so we, we may not be able to answer each and every one of them. There is obviously uh, been um, James's commitment to follow some of them up within the policy team and uh, that document is being uh, developed um, in the coming days as well. So we'll, we'll crack on uh, and see if we can fit in as uh, many as we can. So my next question is here looking at uh, larger farms. Will larger farmers be able to claim capital works and grants similar to the FBG, the Farm Business Grant, without the extremely bureaucratic and competitive system that was involved in the SPG, uh, Sustainable Production Grant. There was a previously a business turnover cutoff for the grants in Wales, but not in England. Uh, yeah, so si si simple answer really is yes, uh, we will make capital grants available through the scheme. We, um, you know, in the future, we will be collapsing a lot of the existing support mechanisms, FBG, SPG, um, BPS I mentioned already uh, into the scheme essentially. So the scheme will be the main vehicle for the provision of government support and particularly in our optional actions there are a range of things that we would um, uh, we would point towards capital grants being available to farmers for. Uh, there's a question here, how do you get invited to sit on the panel for tenant farmers? I think you referred to earlier that uh, tenant farmers working group, potentially one of the participants might want to get involved. How can they? So we're talking to stakeholders about the working group. So what we want, um, you, you know, so if you are a member of a stakeholder organisation, by all means, um, talk talk to them about um, your interest in that. But we will, you know, for example, be coming to the farming unions to ask them for a, uh, some representatives to sit on those working groups. We'll have to keep them, you know, fairly small um, because we need to we need to get into the kind of meat of uh, a number of issues, particularly, you know, access for tenancy, for example, access to the scheme and you know some of the barriers we've talked about, particularly in relation to potentially tree planting already. Um, but, you know, um, we, we're looking for stakeholders really to put forward some names for us to work with in terms of those of those groups. Um, if you're not a member of those stakeholder organisations, please feed your views in through co-design. Thank you. Uh, how do intensive livestock units fit into the plan for sustainable farming? Do you recognise intensive sustainability essentially? Yeah, so I think, uh, as, again, good question. I mean, what we want, uh, what we've tried to do is design a scheme that um, you know, we hope um, most farms can enter into. Now, um, you know, that will be an individual choice for the farm business and the, the farmer at the end of the day, you know, whether it's right for their for their business, whether they want to join the scheme. Um, but again, what, I've, what we try to do is say, well, these are the universal actions we want to deliver through the scheme. This is why we want to deliver it, because of the delivery of the outcomes that I've talked about um, uh, throughout the session. Um, uh, and, you know, um, if that's right for you and your farm business, we want to incentivize you to join the scheme through um, uh, you know, a, a, a payment rate which uh, encourages your participation. And I think that's that's how I'd probably frame it. We've tried to design a scheme which is um, accessible to all farm types. Um, if you have specific issues, I guess, particularly from an intensive farming perspective around why that might not be the case, then uh, again, you know, we'd like to hear from you through co-design because if we are creating barriers to certain sectors or certain types of farming practice, then we'd like to hear hear about it. And what about sustainable land management undertaken by non-farmers, for example, small woodland owners? Uh, well, I mean, there is, uh, uh, you know, a range of other support available through government and our on our rural programmes, but this is a scheme for farmers, you know, it's a sustainable farming scheme. It, the, the actions and the eligibility are designed around farming practices. It's 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 we've designed it for farmers in mind. Um, uh, you know, and, and what we want to do is, you know, um, support those who are undertaking agricultural activities and also those who can undertake all of the universal actions as we've um, we've talked about today. And there's a specific question here about last year. So this is um, existing schemes as opposed to new schemes. When do you hope to confirm whether the current Glaster advanced organic and commons contracts will be extended or not to 2024 stroke 25? 
Yeah, again, that's the decision the minister needs needs to take this year. So again, the, you know, we've confirmed that they'll be extended to 23 to give that certainty. Um, budget settlement was in in April. Um, you know, we've been working hard on the scheme in between now and then, but we do recognise that there's that gap in 24 and into the new scheme at the moment. Um, as soon as we can, we'll get that. Um, we'll, we'll we'll be providing advice to the minister, um, and the minister will will need to make a decision around around that support in 24 and beyond. Thank you. Jumping back now to the sustainable farming scheme and looking at the three layers uh, once again, and in particular the collaboration layer, there's a question here. Will collaborative projects working with organisations such as public services be supported through this new scheme? For example, wildfire risk management being led and developed with local fire services. Uh, yeah, simple answer is yes. We've tried to we, we've tried to make the collaborative layer as flexible as we can and where there are you know local initiatives um uh you know local initiatives which would support you know the community aspect if you like of sustainable land management um uh, and safety would certainly be one of those and yes we would want to support um those types of initiatives i think you know that for us collaboration is about bringing in perhaps as you've said for you know other parties into that working with the farmer to deliver um, you know, outcomes by, you know, different types of farm management practice. But yeah, absolutely, I think we would look at, you know, opportunities for collaboration um, from a community perspective as much as a habitat perspective or a food production perspective. And there's an offer here um, from a group of interested farmers and landowners uh, covering 500 acres in Montgomeryshire. Can we apply to act as a pilot group for the collaborative option? If so, who do we contact? Um, so we will be opening a, a our, our replacement, if you like, for our um, our sustainable management scheme. Um, I believe later this year it's going to be called our uh, integrated nature recovery scheme, uh, natural resources, I, NR, I, I, NRS anyway. Um, uh, and it will be through that process again that we would like to pilot some of the interventions in in the collaborative layer of the scheme as we propose it. Um, again, and, and it would be through that that you would apply for. Um, uh, uh, you, you know, entry into that scheme as part of a pilot. Um, maybe I can provide in a bit of Q&A a bit more detail about when, when people can expect to see that um, coming live. Uh, there's a question here. Has uh, any consideration been given to how the scheme might interact with the forthcoming community food strategy and a commitment to increase the amount of locally produced food entering uh, the supply chain for schools um, and to help with the commitment on universal free school meals so more local food on the public plate does yeah. this fit in yeah yes i think it does yeah so um I, again you know playing to that point i made uh, actually a moment ago in a different context around community but but also collaboration so you know i think um we would we would encourage that type of collaborative collaboration between you know farm businesses to supply uh into for example public sector contracts um and collab you know if we can encourage collaboration through that um downstream supply chain then that could well lead to um you know support for um you know food produced locally being on the uh, on plates locally um uh, be, beyond that i guess it's the type of thing we're talking about in, in terms of extending opportunities for um diversification so you know opportunities for um you know mixed farm more mixed farming approaches or diversification into horticulture which may again play into that local market opportunity we'd we'd well we we'd, we'd actively try and seek to support that through the scheme and some of the actions in the scheme there's an interesting question here about payment rates and whether uh, annual payment rates might fluctuate with rising costs. So if you set payment rates at the beginning of the contract and the cost of fulfilling some of those actions increase outside the farmer's control during, during that three or five year term, whatever it is, will payments shift to reflect that or will they be set at, at a level? Uh, we haven't made a decision on that yet, but I, I think it's fair to say we will have to review payment rates periodically, you know, um, particularly, as you say, in relation to, um, you know, potential costs of various actions and what we're asking a farmer to undertake. So no decision on that. But, you know, we, we do know we'll have to review um, payment rates as part of the scheme, uh, as part of the evaluation of the scheme every um, uh, every period. So. Uh, there's a question here linking uh, with the carbon offsetting. Will carbon offsetting schemes in the future be banned from gaining financially from the sustainable farming scheme? Try to tackle some of the issues possibly around large corporations buying up farmland for, for, for that purpose. Well, I think one of the things, and this is, we, we, we'd love to you know get some views on this that one of the ways that we try to frame the scheme is as is as a farming scheme so you know we we think it would largely prevent those kind of large corporations buying farmland for afforestation from from entry for this kind of layer of government support um 
Uh, but again, we we you know really welcome views on whether we're achieving that um, achieving that kind of goal, if you like, through our through our eligibility criteria and how we've set the universal actions to be you know largely related to farm uh, farm practice. Um, so you know really interested um, for views there. But yeah, I mean we we want to support farmers. I think is the is the bottom line here, and we want to you know transition from the existing systems of EU support, um, the Common Agricultural Policy and uh, the Basic Payment Scheme into this into this into this scheme in the future. Um, and, and as I've said a couple of times, we want to incentivize that. So making sure the payment rates, you know, reward the farmer for the, the things that they're doing um, uh, and support them to undertake the actions is 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 kind of our, you know, it's kind of the purpose of the scheme and how we've designed it. Uh, interestingly, following on on the tree planting uh, option, also not option, I say universal action, I should say, is the infrastructure in place to provide the large number of sapling trees needed in time for this? And will the price be capped or left to the open market? Yeah, that, that's a really important point, I think. And, and and there are probably a couple of areas of the scheme where capacity, we recognise there may be an issue. And again, one of the reasons for publishing the scheme um, uh, details now is to, um, it, you know, is to prepare the industry in the wider sense, actually, for the change that we can, uh, that, that may be coming over the next, over the course of the next decade. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly we're talking to our colleagues in our, um, in our forestry policy branch about the need for saplings to be, or in order to discharge the actions, in order to meet the targets that we've talked about as part of this session. So yeah, I think capacity as a general point is, um, uh, is a really is really important both in terms of you know things like saplings but also in terms of you know access to the right information and support that we that we need to give farmers through the scheme and again by publishing the proposals now we hope that you know the wider sector so beyond the farm gate uh, can think about what they might um, you know helpfully provide and support farmers for in the future as well. Thank you James. Um... Many of us are not eligible for small um, environmental grants due to mapping restrictions. They also don't result in revenue, which is particularly challenging for tenants. For those of us who want to do more for nature now, why is there nothing that can be rewarded for until at least 2025? Um, well, I mean, we've always had a number of schemes that have been available over over you know various years, environmental schemes. I'm not sure about what the particular um, you know uh, eligibility restrictions were for the for the persons who's posted the question, but um, you know would be interested in finding out a bit more about that. Uh, as I've talked about, I you know we we will be looking to prepare and pilot farmers over the next couple of years. So I've talked about a couple of the types of schemes that we're looking to um, introduce already. So I talked about the collaborative scheme. I've talked about the tree planting scheme. You know there will be more things that we would want farmers to participate in. Each of those will have criteria, of course, and you know, be open to applicants to apply for those. But, um, you know, we are looking to open up effectively as many of the actions in the scheme as we can in advance of it, not least to test their, as I said, deliverability and practicality, but also to start delivering some of those outcomes now. Well, I guess that the, the point that's possibly within that question is farmers who want to engage in Glastiv for the very first time can't do so because no new contracts are being offered. Yeah, and I, yeah, I think that's a very fair point. And, you know, particularly thinking about what support is offered between now and now and um, 2025, that's um, I go back to, you know, we will look to introduce schemes between now and then, which will help us transition into the sustainable farming scheme. So I've given a couple of examples today. Um, I, you know, there's more in the pipeline, but, you know, we've got to manage that against an existing, you know, the budget, of course, um, uh, and, you know, the commitments that are already in place for things around last year contracts, which, you know, in many cases are multi year. What is the thinking behind starting the transition three months into the new year, uh, i.e. the 1st of April 2025? Would it not be easier for all round for the transition to start on the 1st of January 26 uh, and follow the calendar year? Um, yeah, good question. Um, uh, something we've debated actually um, quite a little bit in terms of our transition proposals. I mean, the the, the simple reason is that, that that's how government financial years work. So we can we can effectively understand what the budget will be. The government will have in the financial year from the first of April to to the thirty first of March, uh, and then we can open up the scheme accordingly to that to that budget R rather than calendar years, which would be spanning every calendar year. They'd be spanning um, two budget periods, and there therefore we think we can provide greater certainty by by aligning the scheme to um, the financial year. Um, and there's a question here about the well, that's a contractual question possibly around what happens in the event of, a, of an emergency, a natural disaster, if um, you lose your output, for example, newly planted trees might be lost to fire uh, or drought or disease. Um, insurance currently do not cover for the cost of restocking up to the age of seven years. Uh, we're, pre we're predicted to have more climatic variations leading to drought, disease and wildfire. 
how does the contract potentially deal with those situations? Yeah, I, so I th what we've said is we'll we'll pay farmers for undertaking the actions. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, in, in short, you know, we would have uh, agreed with the farmer that they'll undertake this action. They've undertaken the action and then something has happened which has prevented it delivering the desired outcome. Um, you know, it could be one of any of those reasons. What we wouldn't do then is penalise the farmer because recognising that is entirely, you know, outside of their control. So, um, you know, we need to have some, you know, of course, some rules in terms of the contract in in relation to the good use of public money. But, um, but, but at the same time, I think recognising where a farmers it, they've done what they've we've asked them to do as part of that contract, they've discharged it, and then events have um have prevented that from delivering the outcomes. We wouldn't penalise the farmer in that case. A lot of comments that have been made and you have time, no doubt, James, to go through them around the 10% and, and losing productive land, particularly on food production. A lot of strong views about food security and food production. Uh, is there any reason why, whilst the document on one hand does state the importance of maintaining uh, the, the levels of food production, it's not listed as an outcome uh, under the sustainable land management outcomes, couldn't increase or maintaining at the very least the current levels of production be an outcome that needs to be uh, considered? Yeah, I, I think, you know, we don't talk about the climate emergency being um, being an outcome is probably my answer to that. It's a, it, it, um, uh, it's an objective of everything we're trying to do in the scheme is is produce food sustainably. That's that's why it's part of our sustainable land management framework and and that's why it's a complementary we see it as a complementary objective to everything that's in that i think I do, I do take the point about whether it should be a specific outcome and i think that's uh, again something that we probably need to reflect more on in the policy design process but i you know i'd, I'd hope people on it on the call can see the outcomes for example around um, animal health and welfare around resource efficiency as pointing directly towards you know the types of things that we want to help farmers to achieve which can and do obviously support the sustainable production of food so i think uh, I, you know i think we'll reflect further on that because we've had that raised a couple of times of us but you know what we've tried to do is design a scheme that does support farmers to farm i think that's fundamentally important coming through. it's a strong theme coming through in the comments in the in the q a there's a question here about what happens at the end of the five-year contract um what happens in 2030 potentially when this first uh, five years of the sfs comes to an end yeah, good, good question. I think, um, I mean, the first thing to say is we'll obviously uh, at every period we'll want to evaluate the success of the scheme, you know, and that will be from a, a farmer perspective and also from a government perspective, seeing about, you know, um, you know, have we achieved the outcomes we set out the targets that we're wanting to achieve through the scheme? We've talked about some of those, you know, what's been the impact of the, the scheme in terms of the um, the economics of um, uh, rural Wales particularly as well. We want to evaluate the scheme, um, but but in summary, I think what we'd like to do is have a, you know, a, a, the sustainable farming scheme as we as we see it and sitting standing here today, it's easy to say, it, is our scheme for the next generation of farmers. It's the government's, uh, you know, um, flagship support scheme for the, for the next generation. And what we'd like to do is see it evolving, you know, every perhaps five year period um, uh, into, you know, what are the next challenges that we want to support the industry with? Um, how do we maintain and encourage and incentivize farmers to, to continue on the journey, if you like, towards sustainable land management? Um, how do we recognize the good work that's already been achieved through the scheme? And also how do we incentivize, you know, different work or new work in the future, taking into account, you know, advances in technology, etc. So, you know, perhaps a little aspiration on it will obviously depend on government changes and so on and so forth. But what we want to do is to create a sustainable farming scheme for a generation. And now there's a question here, sort of challenging the rationale of the benefits of planting trees. And I know we've talked a lot about trees, uh, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a point well made that it's, that's worth noting and have your views on, James. Where is the scientific evidence that a hectare of woodland sequesters more carbon and supports more diverse species than a more productive land with rotational crops and high organic matter using zero till and other regenerative farming techniques? So. You know the point there. There are other techniques that potentially yep. could be just as valuable as planted trees. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I would like to think that in the scheme there are plenty of opportunities for our, for farmers, both in the universal actions and in the optional actions, to undertake many of the techniques you've talked about there in terms of some regen uh, um, farming practices. I, I, I don't think you know. This is not about saying trees are more implant, important for carbon sequestration than um, carbon locked in soils. This is about recognising that we need to we need to do more to achieve net zero um, and a combination of actions, both in terms of, um, you know, uh, planting trees in line with some of the targets that have been, um, you know, a huge amount of evidence base goes into the 
Committee on Climate Change's report, which has set the targets not just for Wales, but across the UK as well. Um, uh, uh, you know, so a huge range of evidence that supports what we need to do on trees, in addition to, if you like, some of the things we can do to reduce emissions and sequester carbon, for example, in soils. So I don't think it's a it's a linear, you need to do this or you need to do that. We need to do everything we can in government to support the industry achieve net zero. And it's a combination of actions that we're proposing through the scheme, which include tree planting to help us do that. And my, my final question on trees, James, uh, is about the the calculation of that 10% and does the 10% include open mountain and potentially land which you couldn't plant? Yeah, a good a, another good example of a potentially uh, of a potential exemption there, isn't there? So if, um you know, for example, there is a, a particular reason why um, land cannot be planted on and that, as I've said before, I think that could be because it relates to you know, a triple SI or a special area of conservation or, you know, um, uh, you know, particular area of a national park, for example, um, you know, we understand that it wouldn't be reasonable then to include that land in that calculation. Brilliant. Um, where do farms with stone walls fit? Just like hedgerows, they're important landscape features. Some farms will fail to get to 10% without including these really lovely features. The, the document does re refer to heritage and landscape features. Is this one of the options that you're looking into? Yeah, I th and we yes, I think it, yes, I think is a, is a summary. Um, again, um, uh, supporting farmers to maintain good practice already in relation to some of those historical um, uh, protected features is something that we do want to encourage through the scheme. It is an action in the scheme, and where they have it, we would want to support them to do it. Thank you, James. I think we've covered a lot a lot of the questions. Apologies to anybody that we haven't directly answered. I know there's a lot of chatter and a, and a lot of follow up com, com, um, questions, which I'm sure people would want to to forward to the department. But I just want to have enough time before we wrap things up and, and close just to just to really pick up on what happens next, James. There's been a lot of discussion within the two hours we've had here this evening. Clearly, a lot of people will, will reflect on what's been said. Views and thoughts and contributions will, will come to the fore over the coming weeks, and there'll be opportunities to do that on a face-to-face -face level uh, in addition to digitally. So over to you, James. Summarise what happens next. Yeah, uh, thanks, Aled. So um, I think the first thing to say is um, the Royal Welsh Show next week. I know it's going to be hot, but um, there'll be a lot of um, a lot of people from uh, the Welsh government there who've been involved in the design of the scheme at various events and obviously at the pavilion. So, you know, any, anybody on the call who's interested in coming to talk to us about um, the proposals or following up on any of the questions they've asked in the chat, we'd be, be delighted to, to, to see you at the Royal Welsh next week. Of course, then we've got the um, regional agricultural shows and we're going to make sure we have a presence at uh, are the key ones around Wales um, throughout the course of the summer. So again, you know, if you're out and about, come and come and talk to a member of the team. I, I think more generally, I you know, I'd really encourage everybody who's interested in following this up further to to, to register for co-design. So we will be. Um, uh, uh, the first stage of co-design will be to launch our survey, which we hope to do in early August. Um, that will be sent to everybody who's registered and be encouraging them to complete a survey. Uh, again, we'll also do some um, face to face and telephone interviews with those who register for co-design as well. So, you know, again, if you come to a show um, and want to be interviewed as part of that um, process of co-design, we can uh, we can gather your views um, on the scheme proposals um, in that format. And then later in the year, um, so uh, probably towards the autumn or early autumn, we'd look to run uh, a series of workshops with those who registered for co-design so we can test some of the specifics that we talked about uh, uh, in, a, in a group um, and go into a little bit more detail perhaps around some of the proposals and we that we've covered um, either in the document or today so you know I really would encourage everyone to to register for that um, you know we're doing a lot of engagement with stakeholder organizations as I've said particularly through the through the show season so uh, the team are doing their best to be out and about at various events and um, uh, and gathering so again if you're a member of one of those organizations or just interested in coming along then then, then please do and uh, and bring your questions so you know genuinely this is uh, about uh, you know getting the views and feedback from the industry on the proposals these are proposals this is an opportunity to shape those proposals as I said make sure that they work for farmers in Wales that's our intention here in in putting them out like this you know and we we know there will be some challenges in what we've proposed um in the scheme document but we're we're really keen to get feedback so that we can you know we can design truly a policy um for 2025 that that does work for the sector that does work for farmers that does kind of recognize the the, the challenges of the climate and nature emergency but also crucially keeps farmers farming wells and producing um food sustainably
Yeah, and from the questions we've had tonight, James, there's been a lot of practical pointers, issues potentially that will need to be resolved in trying to understand and uh, and apply some of the options and actions which have been set out. But as you said there, this is a real opportunity to influence the shape of this policy. These are simply proposals at this stage. It will lead on, as you mentioned, to a more formal consultation in due course to make the most of of the opportunities to engage in our show next week and other shows and other events over the course of the coming weeks and months well i just want to thank everybody for taking part and taking such an active part in this live event it's been uh, from, from the word go the questions have been flowing in well over 118 uh, and also we had a fantastic retention rate a lot of people still online and have been following us for the entire two hours thank you very much for taking such a keen interest in what is an incredibly important policy shaping the future of farming here in wales for the years to come there will be a document of frequently asked questions available on the welsh government website shortly uh, together with a, uh, um, a recording this recording should simply search sustainable farming scheme on the welsh government website so thank you very much once again to james to all the participants and also the technical team that will be helping in the background. Uh, really appreciate everybody's support. Thank you.